Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sin. Hello and welcome everybody to the Brett Norman YouTube channel. We're doing the reading of the Divine Program of the World History, World's History, excuse me, by Albert Close of the Protestant Truth Society on this Sunday, uh, March 3rd, 2019. And we are on page 58 of the first section of the book. There's actually two sections of the book that uh, have page numbers in the, in the page uh, count of the book uh, that go from Oh, about 1 to 70, and then it starts from 1 all over again in a second part. And we are well into this first part. And today we are under the subtitle, The Great Apostasy of the Eastern Roman Empire, the Eastern Little Horn, and, or Mahabanan Power. And it deals with Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 through 27. And I have joined with me Yerk Lisman and Daryl Eberhardt. And it's wonderful to have a couple brothers in Christ to go through this with because this is uh, uh, very unfamiliar territory for me. So, with that, I'd like to introduce Daryl Eberhardt. Daryl? Yes, here I am in snowy, cold, wet, damp southwest central pennsylvania 
fairly far away from Minnesota, which is often yeah. even colder than my mountain. Pretty much, I'm pretty close to the top of a mountain in the Allegheny Mountains in, uh, again, southwest central Pennsylvania. And we just seem to have lots of snow and freezing rain, and we're having kind of a nasty winter this year. But I'm very thankful to the Lord that I've been out shoveling quite a bit. And for a guy who had a very nasty stroke back in October 2017, the fact that I haven't fallen down while shoveling snow on often a ice rink of a driveway, my dad's driveway is about 192 feet long, uh, is a miracle. And I only fell once this year, and that was getting out of someone's car on that same ice rink that's called a driveway and landed on my back and didn't get hurt. So praise the Lord for that. And that's one of the things I pray for myself and my older relatives and friends and Christian brothers and sisters since uh, York and Brett are younger than I am. I pray that for the older ones that they, they don't have serious falls because as you grow older, uh, broken bones, and I've only had one when a deer ran me over on my motorcycle and broke my leg, but that's the only time I had a broken bone in my life, and I sure don't want one now. So, again, I praise and thank the Lord that I was able to get out, and I am able to get out and shovel, and not so far fall except when I got out of the one car. So, anyway, it's good to be on with you guys. It's good to uh, cover material like uh, a book by Albert Close, uh, who wrote a very a very good book called Jesuit Plots from Elizabethan to Modern Times that I have sitting at the at my off to my left foot here that I can see, and Albert Close uh, did a great job on that book. He, and uh, I don't while I don't have the, this book, I do have it in PDF format thanks to Brett sending it to me, and uh, it's a great book and it's good to study someone who studies Bible prophecy and doesn't come up with all kinds of inventions and uh, stereotyped, uh, uh, choreographed, and uh, orchestrated Jesuit plots such as uh, a pre-tribulation rapture, etc. And we were uh, talking about that a little earlier. And thank goodness, thank God, we've had people uh, like Professor Bob Gundry, who wrote the book uh, First the Antichrist, uh, Dave McPherson, who wrote the book The Three R's, Rapture, Revisionism, Robbery, Pre-Tribulation, Rapturism from 1830 to Hell. There's been a number of people out there that have uh, put the historicist position, not the futurist, the Jesuit orchestrated and choreographed futurist position that is run with. It's a, it's a Jesuit-controlled papal Rome plot to get this proverbial spotlight off of the anti I get off the off of the papacy as being the historic antichrist that is portrayed in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation. So again, we've had a number of people out there trying through the years to warn people that we need to get back to uh, the Bible prophecy of the historicist position and not the either the Jesuit orchestrated futurist or the Jesuit orchestrated preterist position. It's very important where we line up on the prophetic uh, viewpoint of uh, Bible prophecy and history, and obviously the preterist and the futurist positions again, orchestrated by the Jesuits, is the wrong position to take. We need to take the one that the Reformers and Bible-believing Christians have taken throughout history, and that is the historicist position that is the correct position, the correct way of looking at Bible prophecy. So with that said, it's great to be on with both of you again, and uh, looking forward to uh, the reading of uh, Albert Close's book here. Great. Thanks, Daryl. Yerk. Yes, I'm still there. I was very Thank intentionally listening, listening to what Daryl had to say. I very much liked his introduction, also because he starts to mix it up a little bit, naming other authors, other books, which is very fine for the people who regularly started to listen to these broadcasts, so that they are getting more and more ideas, that there are more and more people out there in this world 
mm -hmm. that um, actually you can look up and that wrote about the Jesuit plot that is out there. He call, um, I call it the uh, Jesuit -led Vatican New World Order which is actually nothing else but the restoration of the old world order we had in Europe during the 1203 score years that were prophesied. And now they want to restore what they had in that period, not only in Europe, but all over the world. Because yeah. Satan wants to own the whole world. He doesn't only want to own Europe and the few uh, uh, in, uh, adjacent countries, but he wants to rule the whole world. And he wants to be like God, as he said in Isaiah uh, chapter 14. And the point is that we cannot prevent him doing that. Um, God will even allow it to come into fruition, because in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 15, uh, God says, Yet, yet you will be brought down to the pit. So that means that everything that he wants to do is coming to fulfillment. But yet... You will be brought down to the pit. But what we can do in the meantime is teach to our brethren who are out there, who are Bible-believing Christians of every quote-unquote race, of every quote-unquote color, all of the same blood remind you that the Bible and the Bible alone holds divine truth. And there is no other truth in this world than the truth declared by the Word of God which he put into writing 2,000 years ago for us as a manual that we can hold up and that we can use when we sail through the seas of life in this world. And there is no way how that often enough can be repeated. I, Jörg, Brett and Daryl, we are not doing this for our own fame, for many views and clicks and thumb baits and everything else on our YouTube channels or whatever. But we are doing that to fulfill Jesus Christ's commandment when he said, go out into the world and teach the gospel to every creature. That's what we do. Because when the people do not know the Bible, they do not hear the cry of God in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, when he says, Come out of her, my people. And if we don't do this teaching and telling the people who the Antichrist is and who Christ is, they don't know what to come out of because they think they are fine where they are. That's the deception of all the modern churches that you have today. Oh, you don't have to care for the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist is one little person that comes right at the end of time and you don't even have to care for that because you'll be raptured out before. That's what they teach in all the Protestant, quote-unquote, I should say, Protestant churches. And all the, quote-unquote, denominations, all the sects, all the cults that split from the Roman Catholic Church a few hundred years ago during the Reformation. That is, of course, the same teaching they do in the Roman Catholic Church. So, why does nobody fall about the little stumbling stone that all their churches teach exactly the same thing as the Roman Catholic Church. Well, if you're in a church that teaches the same gospel than the Roman Catholic Church, aren't you in the Roman Catholic Church, actually? <laughs> Why did your quote-unquote so. denomination then split there for a few hundred years ago to get out of there? Maybe because there was some kind of discontentment? Maybe because there was some kind of misunderstanding? They understood that all of a sudden the Bible taught something completely different than the Roman Catholic Church did. And they poured the people out of there by giving the people the Bible, the Word of God, in their own vulgar language. And with vulgar, I don't mean any, anything bad. I mean your mother tongue. Because you're not raised in Latin, are you? If you're raised in Latin, they switch off this video. It's not for you. Yeah? You're a deceived Roman Catholic anyway. You don't want to hear anything. But if you are raised in any other language than Latin, which is, by the way, a dead language, belonging to a dead God, if you are raised in any other language, then you are raised in a living language. And that means that you are a man in the image of the living God. And you need to hear and understand His Word. And therefore, you need to study your Bible. The 
1611 authorized version of the King James Bible, which is the quote-unquote old King James. It's not, it's not old. It's not old-fashioned. It's just the original Bible. Mm-hmm. And not to mix it up with the quote-unquote new King James, which is not new. The only thing they should have done is they call, they should have called it the deceptive King James Bible, <laughs> and the other one is the undeceptive King James Bible. And we base our teachings on the undeceptive, uh, undeceived King James Bible, on the 1611 true authorized version of the Bible that has the Masoretic texts in the Old Testament and the Textus Receptus in the New Testament as the basis of that translation into our mother tongue. Not mine personally, because my mother tongue is German, but Brett and Daryl, who I speak for here, have mm-hmm. English as their native language, as their mother tongue, and in that they have the King James Bible. And that is the Bible the Jesuits are sworn to destroy from the beginning. Because that Bible, or let's rather say those texts that are on the basis of that Bible, are the texts that they hate because they hate the truth. They embrace the lie because they work for the father of lies, the devil. And to show you that that is so, we have come together here today via Skype and wanted to start our 15th reading of this wonderful book from Albert Close, The Divine History of Worlds, uh, The Divine Program of World's History. And as Brett already said, where we are going to go into. It's going to be very interesting. I only have to say you that I didn't have any time to read anything in advance. I didn't prepare anything. So this is to me as new as it is for you. And I didn't study this book of Daniel in depth as I did study other chapters of Daniel. So forgive me if not everything that I uh, if I don't understand everything right the very first time, that can always happen here and there a little bit. I am not perfect, but that's no problem, because I don't do this for my fame, as Brett doesn't do it for his fame, or Daryl does it for his fame, but we all do this for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is for him that we do this work. It is by him that we do this work. So, if it's all right with you, I'm going to start the reading here. Thanks, Yerk. I'd just like to add that it's almost an act of humility to do this because we're not, <clears throat> you know, that's that's one of the really important things about being a Bible believer is being able to show your humility to your brethren and and to make sure they know that you're, uh, willing to sacrifice what you have for the truth. And that's really what this is about, Yerk, I think. Mm-hmm. It's about sacrificing uh, this, this worn-out, lost soul that has been betrayed uh, to find the path to the Lord's redemption. That's really what it's about. It's not anything else. And I really, really am grateful for both Daryl and you, Yerk, to to go through this reading together. And I'm looking forward to getting <clears throat> some kind of grasp on, on this Mohammedan power. And I know we've talked about it a lot before, but uh, Albert Close is going to go into a lot of detail here after the reading of the, of the scripture. So, we should just hop right in. I'm ready. Okay. So, Daryl, we start on page 58 in the book, 38 in the PDF, the second paragraph, the subchapter called The Great Apostasy of the Eastern Roman Empire. The Eastern Little Horn, or Mohammedan Power, as the author calls it. This is described in Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 through 27, where we read, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw that I was at Sushan, in the place uh, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Ulai. And I lifted up mine eyes, and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns. 
and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Oops, <laughs> sorry. And the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, and northward, and southward, so that no beasts might stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will, and became great. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with cola against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground, and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Now, Alexander's empire is divided into four after his death. And that is a, a historical account that you can read everywhere where you go, that the four generals that were fighting beneath Alexander took over his empire and divided his empire into four parts after his death. So we continue to read here in verse 8. Therefore the he-goat vexed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Now we are speaking about the eastern little horn of Daniel, chapter 8, the Mohammedan little power. And out of one of the, uh, out of the, out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of a sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practised and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now before I even continue, I have to make a little comment here. This verse 13 and verse 14 is one of the most wrong taught explanation of biblical prophecy in the world. Because the Seventh-day Adventists adopted this to justify the founding of their church in 1844 by twisting scripture in a way that they say these 2,300 days end when their church has been found and all of a sudden Jesus Christ is going in heaven from the holy place to the most holy place and starting an investigative judgment. This is pure baloney. I know that because that, my, that is what my gut tells me. That is what my heart tells me. That is what my common sense tells me. That is not something that I can prove to you, but I will prove that in the future. I can assure you that. I have already long time planned to get in contact with Nicholas Arthur about this from First Amendment Radio, who gave a wonderful explanation of this understanding of the 2,300 days and that they were not a year, 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 day, pro, day, year prophecy as uh, many others in there, because that has to do with the term that is used in the Bible. And I'm not going into um, detail on this right now, because I just don't have the knowledge. I tell you that honestly, and I don't 
teach anything of which I don't know anything right now. Mm -hmm. But what I'm mm -hmm. telling you is that the common teaching that you embrace in this world about this 2300 days of Daniel chapter 8 is a Jesuitical founded mm -hmm. lie by the Seventh day Adventist church that have been founded by Freemasons that were controlled by the Jesuits yep. from the beginning, whether you like it or you're not. You know, you cannot even be a member of the Seventh day Adventist church if you don't venerate Ellen G. White as a biblical prophetess. And we have no prophets anymore since the early church is gone. And Jesus Christ spoke about that abundantly, but this is not a Bible study to tell you all these little parts. This is a study of this book, The Divine Program of World's History by Albert Close. I'm just telling you at this moment where we come to the reading right here, right now, that for the moment I do not have the complete correct understanding and we will see what the author has to say in this regard, if he mentions this any further on in this reading. But that what you encounter in this world about this 2300 day quote unquote year prophecy from Daniel is not the truth, but is a deceptive twisting of scripture by the quote unquote Seventh day Adventist denomination. Yeah? So, I think Daryl had a comment here to make. I would just second everything you just said, and that is we need to keep in mind that the Jesuits are pretty cunning and sneaky, and that's actually, if you look up the word Jesuit, uh, you're going to find that definition in a number of languages, like even in Russian, my Russian dictionary and that, and English language, where they say Jesuit means sneaky, crafty, cunning, uh, deceptive, yeah. deceitful. <laughs> yep, and that, that it's come to mean that because the Jesuits, that's their middle name, along with another uh, other middle names we can give them, like mass murderers and uh, uh, lovers of genocide, lovers of torture, and lovers of a... Uh, Let's just uh, say, Daryl, they have so many middle names, when you start counting them, you forget what the first and the last name of them is. And the, the, the other point is, is that they throw out not just futurism, which they concocted and dreamt up and invented and choreographed and preterism and that, but they also throw out other st uh, stumbling blocks to people that are seeking the truth, as Yerk had just mentioned, with the Seventh-day Adventism, etc. They want to get everybody off the correct path, the, biblical, the true biblical path of, of explaining the historicist position, and then get them off on a, what we sometimes in America say, get them down, looking down the wrong rabbit hole or whatever. They get them on the wrong trail. They want they want to get again the proverbial spotlight off of the papacy, as the the office of the papacy as being the antichrist. The oh the 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 terrible feeling that they got in the pit of their stomach when the Reformation uh, backed up merely what Christians had been saying for centuries, and that is is that the office of the papacy is the antichrist. So, yeah, very good point there, Yerk. Uh, we need to watch out because they're putting a bunch of stumbling blocks out in front of people to keep them away from the truth. And that's why it's good that we're going through this book by Albert Close. Thanks, Daryl. Any comment from you, Brett? Uh, I was just looking in the other book here of uh, the Great Exodus or the Time of the End at the beginning of the book, there is a small portion where the author mentions that uh, basically, I'm trying to remember this, I'm trying to look it up at the same time and I can't find it at the moment, but uh, basically it seems that the falsehood always comes first in Bible prophecy. You know, we always get told the falsehood first and the truth takes a long time to digest. And I think that's true with this 1844 uh, prophecy of the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. When you take a look at these videos, uh, there was a video done on that on YouTube, and I cannot remember the name, uh, the name or the title of the video, but it was pretty shocking to me when I saw it because, uh, you know, um, what happens when you predict 
something in the Bible and it turns out to be false. Well, <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. It doesn't uh, sit well and uh, pretty much destroys your platform. Mm-hmm. You mean so. sort of like the 88 reasons why the rapture has to happen in 1988? <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like there that. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, these guys have made all kinds of predictions, and anytime they've done it, you wait around a little bit at time, and they end up being wrong constantly. So why is, does that a, is that a good endorsement of the futurist position? When these guys from Hal Lindsey and many others, Waldvord, there's all kinds of names we can toss out that these guys that came along after the 1830s and even up to the present time, and they're always wrong. They make predictions of when uh, uh, the rapture is going to occur, and they're always wrong. None of them have been correct yet. (laughs) Go ahead, guys. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's on page four and five for anyone that wants to look that up on uh, the, uh, excuse me, the the Great Exodus or the Time of the End uh, PDF. I think I might have a link in the description box of this video as well. So, yeah, it's a really good read. And we, we started that book. And uh, this is one reason why we're reading this wonderful little book by Albert Close at the moment is to get a bigger picture of uh, what the uh, Protestants held before before World War II, really. Um, mm-hmm. That's the way I'm looking at it. I don't know about you guys, but uh, yeah, I really, really appreciate the, uh, the reading here. So let's move on. I'm just looking at the book, The Great Exodus, here, as you can see on the screen. Oh, good, on, yeah. You, you Bottom said on page, of page four or five? Four. Yeah, bottom, bottom sentence, uh, the, uh, you man's, see this... Uh, man's humble part is to sit down and by an attentive and patient comparison to the two to seek to understand what the spirit of prophecy did signify when he spake an old time of the things that were to come to pass hereafter. Such a task, it is true, is but little fitted to, graf- to gratify man's pride. It is the only task, nevertheless, for which he is competent. If, from interpreting prophecy, he shall fall to prophesying, it is not difficult to foretell the result. He will wander from light into darkness. Well, this to me is a perfect explanation of Mrs. Ellen G. White, if you ask. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's it. Yeah, uh, that's, sure is. That's a good point that you found here, Brett. Yeah. Well, yeah, and uh, just those things stick with me, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I should have colored this in, but I can't color this in yet. This is a, uh, a, a PDF that you maybe still have to uh, oh, unlock, process for, unlock for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, so yep, I can do yep. that. Anyway, yeah, right. are we going to continue read the Divine Program? Please, yeah. let's do it. Um, it is not that we want to stir up some controversy here. Get me right in this, please, yeah? This was not the idea, and I think Daryl made it very clear with his explanation too. But I'm just telling you, and Daryl is telling you, and Brett is telling you, don't believe everything that is put out there. Check everything against the Bible, and when you don't get a complete biblical understanding, then fall on your knees and pray to God that he gives you the understanding. The more you study the Bible, the more understanding you will gain. But you will not gain it overnight. Some things you have to pray for for weeks, months, or even years before you understand them. And then all of a sudden, you will get your revelation. But that has to come out of the understanding of the Word of God and not by the teaching of man. Not me teaching it to you, not Daryl teaching it to you, not Brett teaching it to you, but the Bible, the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ and our Father who is in heaven. Okay? So, now let's continue and see what the author further says. The divine interpretation continues then on verse 15. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. 
so he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid. I fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in deep sleep on my face toward the ground. But he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grisha. Quote, unquote, Alexander the Great, right? Mm -hmm. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now, that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, uh, the four generals of Alexander the Great, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding, dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Now, even I haven't read this before, I can tell you, he deals here with this um, merging, with, with the end of the Grecian Empire, going into the Roman Empire, yeah? in the latter time mm -hmm. of the Grecian Empire, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, understanding dark sentences, I don't think there's any better way to explain the papacy, shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, because Revelation chapter 13 tells us that he got his power, his authority and deceit from the devil, from Satan. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. What did he do during the 1203 score years and during the inquisitions? This is speaking of the end of the Grecian and the beginning of the Roman Empire. And through his policy, also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Isn't that what the Pope does today? By peace destroy many? And he shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Yeah, he shall be broken with the stone, not cut out with hands, right? Mm -hmm. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. It is important to note, the author says, that there are two little horns mentioned in Daniel, one in chapter 7 and the other in chapter 8. Now the one in chapter 7 trod down the Christian church in Western Europe, and the one in chapter 8 trod down the Christian church in Eastern Europe and in Asia and Africa. After Alexander's death at Babylon in B.C. 333, his empire was divided amongst his four generals, as I mentioned already earlier. Out of one of those four kingdoms, the great Turkish and Mohammedan power arose. Now the 2,300 years, and so now we're going to get it, right? <laughs> I didn't know it. Well, let's see what he has to say. <laughs> Daniel chapter 8, verse 9, And out of one of them, i.e. one of the four kingdoms into which the empire of Alexander the Great was divided, came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. 
and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. And then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, or to that wonderful numberer, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the making desolate, to give both the sanctuary and the host to, the, uh, to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days shall the sanctuary be cleansed. I will make thee known what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Now in the year 553 before Christ, the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, and about fifteen years before his subjugation by Darius the Mede, there was granted to Daniel a third great symbolic vision, that of the ram and the he-goat, affording a fuller glance than the previous one at the history of the second and third of the four great monarchies. You remember, as we were speaking about in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, every prophecy is going a little bit deeper into that what was declared in the, in the prophecy before. Now, given as it was at the time when the Babylonian Empire and captivity were both rapidly drawing to a close, this vision naturally unfolds God's providence with regard to Israel and Palestine under the Medo-Persian and Grecian empires. The symbols shown to Daniel prefigured their history with graphic accuracy. The successive rise of the two horns of the ram, foreshowing the sway of the two dynasties, which were afterwards merged in the great Medo-Persian monarchy, the he-goat from the west, with his rapid course, great strength, wide dominion and notable horn, abruptly broken in the plenitude of the goat's power and replaced by four notable horns, prefiguring to the life of the locality of origin, the character, the cause of conquest and subsequent history of the Macedonian or Greek Empire of Alexander the Great, as well as its fourfold division consequent on his premature death. In twelve brief years that European monarch overran and subdued all the fairest provinces of Asia. And no sooner had he reached the zenith of power than he died, and his empire, after a period of confusion, was divided after the Battle of Ipsus in before Christ 331. Among Alexander's four generals, Potalmi, Seleucus, Lysimachus and Cassander. From one of these kingdoms, the prophecy foretells that there would arise in the latter time a little horn, which would ultimately wax exceeding great, greater apparently than the notable horn itself, which is said to wax only very great. This quote-unquote little horn is evidently a fellow to the little horn of the previous vision, only it rises as a political power not amid the ten kingdoms of the Roman earth, but from one of the four branches of Alexander's great empire. So I was not correct with my explanation a little bit before when I uh, understood this even to be the papacy. This is another little horn. Now, let's set the record straight. I was wrong there. These four were the Syrian kingdom of the Seleucidae, of the Seleucidae, the Macedonian kingdom of Cassander, the Egyptian kingdom of Ptolemy, and the kingdom of Lysimachus, which included Thrace, Bithynia, and other parts of Asia. In AD 629, Mohammed entered Syria with the Saracens and began a terrible course of conquest of Eastern Roman Christendom. 
The direction of the early conquests of, his sing of this singular power are distinctly given toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. The main features of his conduct, as described in the vision, are his self-exaltation against the prince of princes, his persecution of the saints, his taking away the daily sacrifice and defiling the sanctuary, and his casting down the truth to the ground. While beholding the vision, Daniel heard the question asked of the wonderful numberer, who made the revelation, apparently the Lord himself. Quote, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the making desolate to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Unquote. And it is an answer to this question that the period we are considering is named. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, as this question was asked and answered before the close of the captivity in Babylon, and when therefore the daily sacrifice and the sanctuary were not in existence, it is clear that this prediction of a sound destruction supposes a prior restoration. This predicted period of 2,300 years commences, therefore, at some point in the time of the restored national existence and ritual worship of the Jews, and includes the entire period of their subsequent dispersion and of the desolation of the sanctuary. Its earliest possible starting point is in the decree of Artaxerxes to restore and build Jerusalem, BC 457, and reckoned thus its opening portion is the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9, and its second proportion is the 1810 years which follow, and end in AD 1844, the terminus of so many prophetic times. So now we are learning some Seventh-day Adventist teaching by Albert Close, or what? Yeah. An important wow. latter stating point is the era of the Seleucidae, for the era of the founder of the great Syrian dynasty, which included Antiochus Epiphanes, the first of the three powers referred to in the prophecy as defiling the sanctuary and causing the daily sacrifice to cease. Reckoned in lunar years from the era of Seleucidae and it should be remembered that the long Mohammedan period of desolation, which it includes, is measured by lunar years, is, it terminates in AD 1990 through 1920, or just 75 years later on than when reckoned in solar years from the decree of Artaxerxes. Thus reckoned in solar and in lunar years from these two most important starting points, it terminates first at the commencement and then at the close of the last 75 years of the great seven times of prophecy. The place of paramount importance in this prediction is given to the career and actings of an eastern little horn, and our knowledge that the papacy was the power predicted under the symbol of the Roman or western little horn affords a clue to the meaning of this sister symbol. Well, that's an interesting uh, remark that he makes, a sister symbol, yeah? because Mohammedism, or Islam, as it is almost every time called today, is just a sister or a daughter of the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> right. Now, the whole range of prophecy presents two, and only two, little horns, and the whole range of history presents two, and only two powers which exactly answer to the symbols. Powers which, small and insignificant at first, gradually acquire empire on the ground of religion and wax exceeding great by so doing, proudly oppose Christ and fiercely present, present his people, repress and exterminate his truth, enjoy dominion for many long centuries during which they tread down Jerusalem, either spiritual or literal and perish at last under the judgment of God. Now the mm, That's uh, fiercely persecute, Yerk, I think. What, what did I you read? <clears throat> uh, something else, but that's okay. Proudly oppose Christ and fiercely persecute his people, yeah. 
proudly oppose Christ and fiercely persecute his people, repress and exterminate his truth, enjoy dominion for many long centuries during which they tread down Jerusalem, either spiritual or literal, and perish at last under the judgment of God. The papacy does not stand out more distinctly as the great apostasy of the West than does Mohammedism in the great uh, parallel apostasy of the East. The one originated from within the church, the other from without, but they rose together in the beginning of the 7th century. They have run chronologically similar courses. They have both based their empire on religious pretensions, the one defiled and trampled down in the church of, the Western, of Western Europe, and the other defiled and trod down in Jerusalem. In their, own li in their life they have been companion evils, and in their death they are not divided. For the one has just expired politically in 1870, and the power of the other is fast expiring. Papal Rome Latinized the services of the Western Church in 663 BC. Papal Rome Latinized the services of the Western Church in 663. Mohammedism trod down the Eastern Church in AD 637, when Jerusalem was captured and the Mosque of Omar was erected on the site of the Temple. Between A.D. 634 and 644, Omar destroyed 4,000 churches and built 1,400 Mohammedan mosques in Eastern Christendom. The Mohammedan power is, we think, unquestionably the main fulfillment of this symbol, but it is almost equally clear that it had a precursor fulfillment on a smaller scale in the person and history of Antiochus Epiphanes. His career accords so closely with almost every feature of the prediction as to leave little room for doubt that it was intended by the Holy Spirit as one subject of the prophecy. For 17 centuries all expositors, Jewish and Christian, held that the prophecy referred to Antiochus. The book of Maccabees record his career with great detail and trace in it, as does Josephus, the fulfillment of the predictions of this little horn. But Antiochus never waxed exceeding great. He never threw down the place of the sanctuary, though he took away the daily sacrifice, and he lived too near to the time when prophecy was given to be the full and proper fulfillment of it, seeing it is said of the vision, quote, it shall be for many days, at the last end of the indignation. Now besides this, the time of the desolation effected by Antiochus, just three years does not in any way or, an, or on any system correspond with 2,300 days, so that we are driven to regard this as one of those prophecies which has undoubtedly a double fulfillment, like Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 or Psalm 72. Antiochus was a precursive little horn, Mohammedism is the full and proper reality intended by the symbol. A certain freedom in the construction of terms must be allowed in the case of all such double predictions, because the Holy Spirit having more than one event in view, and selecting for description mainly those features which are common to both, may also introduce some peculiar to the one or to the other. Antiochus Epiphanes, the Romans, and the Mohammedans have all taken part in accomplishing these predicted desolations of Jerusalem. The first two, Epiphanes and the Romans, took away the daily sacrifice, the second cast down the sanctuary. All three have defiled the place of the sanctuary, have trodden it underfoot, and by the last two especially have the mighty and holy people been cast down and stamped upon and destroyed. But as the Roman power cannot be represented as a little horn arising out of one of the four kingdoms into which Dan uh, Alexander's empire was divided, Whereas both Antiochus and Mohammedan can, we conclude that they mainly are referred to in the prediction and especially the latter. 
It must be borne in mind that no sooner did the Roman Empire cease to tread down Jerusalem than the Muslim power began to do so, and has continued to do so to this day. The utmost efforts of Christendom, expended in eight different crusades, failed to drive the Muslims out of the Holy Land. For twelve centuries he has defiled the sanctuary and stood up against the princes of prince, uh, prince of princes, casting down the truth to the ground, practicing the, uh, and prospering. But it is written that when the, this period of 2,300 days comes to an end, he shall be broken without hand. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, first then, with reference to the earlier of the two terminations of the 2,300 years already named. From BC 457, 2,300 years lead to the incipient, incipient beginning of the cleansing of the sanctuary in AD 1844, when Turkey signed the first decree of toleration. Now, this is something where it gets interesting now. You see? Yeah, because exactly. This 1844 has nothing to do with the teaching of the SDH. Nothing to do with the Western power. Right. Nothing to do with the Western power, but it has to do everything with the fall of the Mohammedan Empire. And the total decline of the Mohammedan Empire was fulfilled in 1919. And didn't we just see the um, 1920, that they were speaking about the time of 1920, because the 75 years later, yeah, when you go from uh, 1844, 70 years, uh, 75 years later, where are you? 1920, right? 1919, mm -hmm. 1920. Mm -hmm. Can I count correct? 1844 plus 5 is 1849 plus 70 is 1919. Yep. At the end of World War I, the yep. Ottoman Empire was destroyed. That's why you had the Balfour Declaration during World War I, making sure that Palestine, after the breaking up of oh, the Ottoman Empire, wow. could be given to the quote-unquote Jews. Do you see the deception of the SDA church now? I mean, I have been reading through every sentence without a good understanding the last two pages because it really no. set me up what the author <laughs> said before with this 1844, but now it all of a sudden comes to a conclusion that makes so much sense. And I want to stop the reading right here and tell you that next time we come together, both Brett and Daryl have had time to read this again for themselves and I too. And we are going to study this again, because what this culminates right now into is a absolute, how do you say that, um, a, um, uh, oh, I don't come to the right word. I, I'm, I'm lost it's for words okay. sometimes. I'm lost for words sometimes. I'm sorry. It's, it's yeah, and this it's is a repudiation. The it's a repudiation of all Thank the you. quote unquote teaching of the SDA Church. This needs further study, as well for Brett, as for Daryl, as for me. And this is why I want to stop the reading for today. We can still have a little talk under us brothers together and explain this to you. But this little last sentence that I just read comes to the epitome that. The 2,300 days predicted by Daniel chapter 8 has nothing to do with Rome, but everything to do with the child of Rome, Mohammedism, Islam, yep. as we call it today. And their starting of their decline between 1844 and 18, uh, 1919. Until next time, all three of us, and this is a pledge that I do, all three of us will go and look up history wherever we can find it to see what happened in 1844 and the surrounding years to Mohammedism politically in this world. Because this is something that I did not study yet. And I guess this is something that Daryl did not study yet. And that is something that Brett did not study yet. Well, we're going to take our time.
And when we come together next time, we will go into this, and then we will continue reading in this book, and we will explain to you that the common taught teaching of the 2,300-day-year prophecy of Daniel, chapter 8, by the SDA, is a Jesuitical lie to distract from what it is, re what it really is. And with that, I'm going to end my part for today. Of course, I'll still be available if you guys need me to say something, but I'm going to give it to Daryl for the close-up. People need to be aware, or maybe a better word, beware. Beware of, be leery of. Some of these writers like Grant R. Jeffrey, Tim LaHaye, Hal Lindsey, these guys are the ones that have uh, pushed, endorsed a lot of this futurist thought, this Jesuit or originated uh, pre-tribulation rapture and dispensationalism and uh, futurist. All the whole package goes together, and again, it's it's designed again to get the proverbial spotlight off of the papacy, the office of the pope as being the historic, the historicist position, the historical antichrist. And that's, although reformers didn't agree on everything, that's one thing they all agreed on. And they were in agreement with a lot of the Puritan scholars, with uh, Albigenses, Waldenses, that had studied this topic very much. And they all came to the same conclusion, again, that the office of the papacy was the Antichrist. So be very, very leery of a lot of this stuff that's come out in the, especially around the time of Hal Lindsey, it really took off uh, with his book, I'm looking here, The Late Great Planet Earth, was Zondervan Publishing House that pushed, put that book out. Uh, all of these things have gotten people again looking down the wrong rabbit hole and we need to be very very leery that uh the jesuits have thrown a lot of a lot of fake stuff out there in order to get people off of the trail of of the papacy so again preterism futurism both dreamed up by jesuits um preterism was uh alcacer and futurism, of course, was uh, Lacunza and Ribera. Some people say Ribera. It doesn't matter. These guys were Jesuits. The one, uh, Lacunza, I think, was a Chilean uh, Jesuit. Uh, Ribera, Ribera was a Spanish Jesuit. But uh, they came up with these theories, again, to take the spotlight off of the papacy, the uh, take the bad rap that they felt they got from the reformers, but the reformers were the correct in their analysis of the whole picture of that, that uh, the papacy would be the persecuting power that would be out there, and history proves it big time. Uh, at least 50 million, at least 50 million by credible, even secular historians say that at least... The papacy, the papal Rome, slaughtered at least 50 million Christians throughout history, and probably maybe have a little bit more. But you toss in the Inquisition, the papal crusades uh, that were not only launched against um, the Middle East, but they were launched in uh, uh, northwest Italy. They were launched into southern France in an attempt to destroy Bible-believing Christianity, something that uh, the, the papal church has done for century after century after century. As I sometimes say, every, 50, every 30 to 50 years, they go on a mass murder spree. And it's something that it's not pleasant to talk about. It's not pleasant to talk about, like Yerk sent me the, the video about Jasenovich, and at that horrible uh, camp uh, where they were slaughtering uh, Serb Orthodox Christians mainly, but uh, uh, they, that was the primary target during World War II. Um, the uh, Roman Catholic Ostashi, and that's a whole story there of, 
the books have been written about that, Ravening Wolves and Avro Manhattan, Edmund Paris, Convert or Die, uh, The Vatican's Holocaust. Uh, this is just, it's not only the 20th century, it's century after century after century, and we're trying to expose these mass murderers for who they are and what they are, and they're murder incorporated. That's what they are. And they control the international intelligence community. They control the international banking slash financial community. And it's all run by Jesuit-controlled papal Rome. So we need to, to name the correct names, and that's the correct name of the people that are are the big uh, fomenters of wars, including world wars. And again, people like Edmund Paris, a French author uh, who was born Roman Catholic, uh, wrote a book, uh, uh, the Secret History of the Jesuits, where he very clearly lays out that uh, World War I and World War II were fomented by Jesuit-controlled papal Rome. And you can get that book through Chick Publications, chick.com. It's called The Secret History of the Jesuits. So, again, great being on with both of you. And we're trying to get truth out, and that's important because the Jesuits have tried through false histories and lies and lies and prevarication after prevarication of trying to cover up and hide true history. And we're trying to get true history out, and we're trying to also exalt the Bible. Read your old King James Bible. We're saying that the, so you know the difference. The New King James is based on different Greek manuscripts, and those are mainly Vatican manuscripts, two to five corrupt manuscripts. So if you have the wrong manuscripts to start out with, no matter how good your so-called translators are, they're working off of the wrong materials. So again, as Yerk already mentioned, there's two Masoretic texts, by the way. The King James uses the correct Masoretic text. And there's a bunch of uh, Greek manuscripts out there, the majority ones, are the received text or the Textus Receptus, for which the King James New Testament is based on its translation, not the newer versions that are based on between two to five, again, corrupt Vatican manuscripts. So very important points. We all need to have our noses in the Bible, read our, uh, for English-speaking people, the old King James Bible, the authorized version and please uh, we all need to be in prayer because we're up against some some pretty nasty cunning crafty murderous folks and we're exposing their history so uh, folks uh, pray for those who are out there on the forefront like Richard Bennett uh, uh, Dr. Ronald Cook those are just names of folks that are in their 80s in their early 80s, well, Richard just Richard Bennett just turned 80, BereanBeacon.org. You need to check his website out almost daily because their homepage, they put a new audio and or a new video up just about every two to three days. And you're never going to go wrong as far as we've seen so far, mm. uh, checking out Richard Bennett's, uh, check out his uh, video called uh, the Catholic Inquisition or the Inquisition because it gets into that Croatian Holocaust that I talked about in World War II. It gets into the horrible torture instruments that were used during the Inquisition, and it gets into the Albigensian Crusades, the isn't slaughter of the... Isn't it interesting, yeah. Daryl? Sorry to interrupt you here, but you're sure. saying that's now for the second time, and I cannot help to intervene here. Isn't it interesting that you just said that one of the main objectives of the Second World War was to get Russia under Roman control again, to yep. destroy the Orthodox Church, yep. which was the border of the Orthodox Church to the Western Roman Catholic Church was in Serbia, that nobody speaks of that Holocaust that took place there, but everybody speaks of the so-called Holocaust that took place from German uh, from Germany against yeah. the Jews. Isn't it strange that nobody speaks of that genocide but only of the other? Doesn't that remind you of what Tapa Saucy called blown cover as cover? Certainly. I mean like this that Holocaust that occurred in Croatia, fascist Croatia, uh Run Roman by Catholic, Pavelic. yeah, yeah, Pavelic and uh, 
against the Peanuts and uh, the others. That was a Jesuit orchestrated, by the way. There were two Jesuit monsignors in archbishop positions, Ivan Sarich and Aloysius Stepanich, or Stepanich, some people say. Mm-hmm. Uh, these two guys orchestrated and choreographed one of the bloodiest, sickest uh, massacre murder, genocide of people in a short period of time in a small area that the world's ever seen. And that pretty much other, except for a few people like uh, Monica Farrell and uh, Edmund Paris and Avro Manhattan, except for a few historians and that out there, that is pretty much unknown amongst uh, the people of the world, is this horrible uh, Holocaust that occurred uh, from 1941 to 1945 in what is today modern day Croatia and part of Serbia, where they murdered between, and the, this is the low figure, between 700,000 to 900,000 Serb Orthodox were murdered by the Roman Catholic Ustashi. Uh, in this Roman Catholic fascist police state that Avro Manhattan pointed out was, this is a beautiful, he said it, a beautiful example. And he doesn't mean it's good looking. He means it's a perfect example of what papal Rome does whenever she has the power to do it, is she uses the state and church combined together to slaughter hundreds of thousands and millions, up to millions of, of people, uh, as she did during the Inquisition. So we need to be aware of when church and state hook up together to carry out genocide and that because they work very closely together and they, 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 uh, they really do a good job of coordinating and planning together. And that's what World War II was. And a lot of people don't realize this is World War II was an, an Inquisition. It was mainly directed at Jews, at Bible-believing Christians, wherever they could find them, so-called Protestants, whether they were nominal or not, it doesn't matter, and Orthodox Christians, whether they were real believers or not, the fact of the matter is is that... Let's call them Orthodox Catholics, because the Eastern Catholic Church is a Catholic Church, as is the Western Catholic Church, but the Western is Roman Catholic and the Eastern is Orthodox, but they are both Catholic. Right. But the thing is, is that the the Catholic Church has always targeted these people, and they have for century after century after century. So if you're not worshiping in the uh, Roman manner, um, as one of the emperors said... If you don't accept the ultra-montane leadership of the Pope then you are an enemy of the Roman Catholic Church, and as such, you will be exterminated. That is a decree of the Council of Trent. Yes, yes. But listen, I just find this so interesting. I never thought of this this way. The Holocaust, the genocide on the Serbs in Croatia, took place between 1941 and 1945. That's the same period they teach that the Holocaust on the Jews in Germany took place, for which they have no proof, but they have a lot of proof for the genocide that happened in Croatia. But nobody looks at Croatia and 750,000 killed Serbians if they can look at 6 million Jews killed by the Germans, right? Mm. Did you ever think of that? Certainly, they want to and cover up. And of course, up those... they needed the, the 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 Holocaust on the Jews. They needed that one. They didn't need that to take happen, but they needed to take that happen in the heads of the people, because otherwise the people would never accept the state of Israel. They wanted to foment out of that. I'm not denying the Holocaust. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying, isn't it strange? that everybody in the world teaches on the Holocaust of the Germans they did with the Jews, in the same period, the Roman Catholic Church by Franciscan monks, the eight of Franciscan monks and nuns even, killed almost a million Orthodox, and then Hitler went into Russia to kill all the Russians, the Orthodox people there, and the people that he didn't kill, Stalin took care on later, because Stalin Mm -hmm. was a Jesuit priest. 
who killed millions and millions of his own brethren, uh, yeah, of his own people, right. and nobody ever speaks about that. They always yep. speak about the Germans, the Germans, the Germans, and their Holocaust against the Jews. Sure. And they forget that Joseph Stalin uh, got his marching orders from a Jesuit priest named uh, Father, so-called, uh, Walsh, that was uh, that founded the uh, oh, Foreign Edmund Service Walsh. School yeah. at Georgetown mm -hmm. University. Georgetown, yeah, exactly. Yep, yeah. Georgetown University went over on a a mission uh, uh, to the Soviet so the Soviet Union and helped gave S Stalin his marching orders. Uh, and again, these these people are Jesuit controlled. They set up a dic they set up all the dictators, the major dictators, Adolf Hitler, uh, Mussolini. And again, uh, all of this is brought out. If you, d you don't believe, don't take our word for any of this. Do a little investigation. Get the book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. Yeah, by I, I, Edmund I read that on my channel, Daryl. So people, yeah, can, but I mean, people can watch me reading that and reading along with me on that. Mm -hmm. huh? yeah, yeah, I read that there. That's uh, just a, such a good book that would, if you, if you read it with an unbiased mind, you're going to see plenty of evidence. Uh, that Edmund Paris, the French author, brings out, and he shows you that rather than trying to prevent these world wars, as the uh, the papal propaganda machine puts out, they fomented both World War One and World War Two. It's backed up by also by J. A. Kenson in his book uh, *Rome Behind the Great War*, uh, that is available in PDF format. That uh, my brother Brett there sent to me. What a great book that is! Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can read those books. With an open mind, you're going to see that these people are the ones that fomented both world Jesuit-controlled papal Rome, fomented World War One, World War Two. They fomented the bloody American Civil War. I mean, uh, 1861 to 1865, that get, led to the premature deaths of 621,000 of the cream of the crop of America's youth. Thank you very much, uh, Jesuit-controlled papal Rome. You are, re you are responsible through your Jesuit front group operating out of Cincinnati, Ohio, and other places uh, in the USA uh, for fomenting that war through that Jesuit front group called the, Knight of the Knights of the Golden Circle. You, every, every war that I've ever tried to look up around and dug a little under a few rocks looking for the true history, you find Jesuit-controlled papal Rome fomenting these bloody wars and revolutions. I mean, it's just that's those are the facts of history that even secular historians have come out and uh, proven. So uh, we're not trying to be mean to anybody. We're just saying, hey, take a look, a, a real look behind the scenes history, and you're going to see that Jesuit controlled papal Rome has so much blood on their hands. And the, the bad part about that is when you think about it is, is if with the weaponry that existed during World War II, they slaughtered up the, and the figure goes from 66 to 70 million people at least, died premature deaths during World War II with uh, what they call atomic weapons, with biological weapons, with chemical weapons. What do you think it's going to be? If World War III goes into on steroids, full fledged going, uh, we may be looking at billions of people dying. So that's why these are important topics. It's not history isn't just interesting to study what happened in the past. We need to, as uh, Spanish-born American philosopher George Santayana stated very wisely, those who can't learn from the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. I'm paraphrasing, but. That's the truth. If we don't like, take a look at history, learn from our Bible. The Bible gives us a great history of what happened to two uh, kingdoms that turned their backs on God. The northern kingdom, when the kingdom was divided during Solomon's son's time, it got divided into two parts, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. God used the Assyrian Empire to punish the northern kingdom and squash them because they turned their back and turned their thumb their nose at God and said, we're not going to follow you. And the same thing happened to the southern kingdom. He used the Babylonians to come in and squash them. So we need to realize that all nations that turn their backs on God, they're in big trouble. They are in big trouble. It's, uh, we as individuals or we as nations, and we need to confess, confess our national sins too because we have beautiful prayers in the Bible, Ezra, 
and Daniel, where they went before God and said, we have sinned, we have sinned, we have sinned as a nation and as a people against you. And we need to do that. We need personal repentance, and we need to repent as a nation. And there's a lot of sins to be repented for from the United States of America. I think that's maybe a good point for me to, to, to stop on, but that's we need to have repentance, and God commands that in the Bible. Thank you, Daryl. Yes, thank you, Yerk. Those are some really, really good comments. And I just want to remind everyone, you know, uh, Daryl uh, mentioned the fact of uh, approaching this in an unbiased way. Well, I tend to think that maybe bias is, is a tough word. I think maybe unprejudiced might be a little better because uh, With an I think open we mind. all have bias, right? Yeah, with an open mind. Yeah, but the, the Willing thing to is… Learn. Yeah. Is that you know this 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 momentum that we have in our minds, and in in, in the, the way of life, and you know our stubborn ways, mm-hmm. uh, tend to tend to want to look. You know, there's there's a lot of sayings like a man only sees what he wants to see and ignores the rest. And I think that. This this kind of attitude in America, Daryl, you you pretty much hit the nail right on the head. This attitude in America that uh, you know um, you just go with the flow kind of thing mm-hmm. is uh, it's got to go. Uh, we have to repent. We absolutely have to repent. The Bible speaks about. Marv or Jesus spoke about marvel not that ye must be born again. And listener, if you're not born again and you are looking at our videos and our criticisms of the Roman Catholics just for the sake of refuting us, um, may I remind you that the history and the topics that we're dealing with are so swept under the rug. I mean, this is an mm-hmm. incredible study we got going here. And you're not going to get this anywhere else uh, except for maybe with Tom Fress <laughs> Inquisition Update. That's the only right. uh, the only study I can say that I get a lot from Tom. I listen into his broadcasts because he's very, very attentive attentive to the details of this uh, incredible history that has been ignored. And, it, you know, we're dealing with um, this book here, and it was actually, Albert Close is merely compiling different portions of four books here. And we just went over uh, Henry Grattan Guinness's exposition of Daniel 8. And that's what gave us this. So we got to give credit where credit is due. And uh, yeah, the book Romanism and the Reformation certainly is an incredible study on its own. But this divine program of the world's history by Henry Grattan Guinness actually is. Mm-hmm inspiration for Albert Close to do this excerpt from his work and also other works. So, it's really, really interesting to continue in the study, and I'm really looking forward to breaking new ground, and I think today we really hit some new ground, and I'm very, very grateful for Yerk and and uh, Daryl to join us, and uh, looking forward to next time, and that's all I got. So, We'll just close it up. God bless everybody. We'll catch up with you soon. Bye-bye for now. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? 
Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep, that your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, We will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy, and sell, and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. 